Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, tonight's live stream event, Quix Quixel Megascans Ecosystem, taking your projects to the next level. Uh, my name is Adam Hartel. I'm a recruiter here at Noman, and it's with great honor that I'll introduce and host our guest this evening. Uh, before I do that, though, I'd like to just give a quick shout out to Lenovo. Uh, thanks to Lenovo, uh, Noman continues to be able to provide uh, content like this evening uh, free to the public. So that is a great plus for us. Um, so with that said, I'd like to now introduce our guest, uh, Epic Games, Galen Davis. Galen has worked as an environment artist and lead uh, an art lead in the games industry for over 10 years, contributing to franchises such as Bioshock, Borderlands, Evolve, Star Wars, and God of War. He now works as an evangelist and producer for Quixel at Epic Games, engaging with AAA teams, enterprise, and education partners. And with that, I want to say, Galen, welcome to the stream. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Adam. This is great. Yeah, I'm really excited uh, for what you're going to be sharing with us tonight. So yeah, just take it away. Cool. All right, uh, so uh, tonight we're just gonna be covering, like Adam was saying, just kind of a, a brief overview of the Megascans ecosystem and uh, pretty much everything that you guys have access to right now, in fact. So I'm not gonna be showing anything that's a future release or anything like that. Everything that we're gonna be looking at tonight is something that you can literally go and download right now, start messing around with. And the best part about it is that it's 100% free. And I'll just make sure that we underline that point because uh, I want to make sure that everyone knows that if you are a student right now and you're working with Unreal Engine, you have access to 100% of everything that we're going to be showing tonight for free, um, which is pretty awesome. I wish that I had had something like that when I was going through school. So Absolutely. <laughs> so, no, it's a game changer for sure. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So, yeah, so I guess uh, we'll just go ahead and jump in. I'm going to share my screen here real quick. All right, Adam, can you... Uh, can you see that already or no? Um, yeah, looks like you're coming through. Cool. All right. So uh, I'll just give a quick history in case uh, in case you guys don't know uh, a little bit about the company. So uh, Quixel was founded uh, about nine years ago at this point. Um, our two co-founders, uh, Wakar and Teddy, uh, they had this amazing vision for the company in which they wanted to create basically the, the digital equivalent of the amazing Hollywood prop houses that uh, that are actually very close to where Nelman is, in fact. Um, so many of these warehouses are just filled with these amazing uh, pieces that make up sets for movies, right? So the idea is that if you're a director for a movie, you bring your U-Haul or 10, and then uh, you come through the door and you just snatch everything you want off the shelves. And that's, you know, you bring it to a set and you shoot your movie. Um, obviously, things are changing a lot, you know, in the space of virtual production and the uh, we'll talk a little bit about that tonight as well. Um, but uh, but that's kind of the vision of the physical embodiment of what we have in digital form here. So um, the best way to think about the Megascans ecosystem is just that, where we want users to be able to grab whatever they want off the shelves, just be maximally creative and not be constrained by a lot of the technical limitations uh, that artists deal with all the time, right? Um, so, so that's kind of the, the core principles of everything that we're going to be going over tonight. Um, and... I'll just reiterate it again, everything you're going to see is entirely free tonight. So everything you're going to see here in the library, you could download the entire thing tonight if you want to. Literally, you could download at the highest resolution, every single thing in the library and just go wild. So the only thing that you need in order to do that, by the way, is an Epic ID, which is really, really easy to set up. All you need is an email and you're good to go. So um, I won't go through the process of setting up an Epic ID for you guys. I'm sure that most of you, if you've opened Unreal Engine, Ever. This is likely something that you have. Um, so just make sure that when you download Bridge that you go through the login options of actually logging in with your Epic ID and then you will have the world at your fingertips here. So um, why don't we just kind of jump in here to the library itself. So this is the, the application that we're going to start with and it's called Bridge. So Bridge is a really easy application to digest. I mean, basically all it is is basically an interface that goes back to every single thing that's in the library. So if you've ever browsed Quixel.com, just the Megascans ecosystem there, this actually looks very similar. So you'll notice a very similar design language. You notice uh, the same way you kind of browse here. But the big difference with this application is that we actually have a lot of other features in here. So uh, we really want this to, like the name implies, basically be the bridge uh, to getting content directly into uh, whatever application it is that you're going to be working inside. So um, 
I'm gonna just hide my my uh, task manager here real quick or my, my tab so that we don't see any of that real quick. So, all right, there we go. And uh, so, so this is, again, this is gonna be your main hub for actually going in and out of these applications and actually trying to uh, bring that content into whatever it is you're gonna be using as Final Pixel. So tonight, obviously we're gonna be using Unreal Engine as the primary vehicle for all of this, uh, but Bridge is really the starting place. So as you can see here, uh, you know, we're just kind of browsing through the, the starter page here of the UI. We like to feature a couple of collections here at the start. So you can see just some of the things that we've, uh, we've published recently uh, that are really getting a lot of traction in the community or things that we've, we just really are super excited to share with all of you guys. So this is where you're going to see a lot of that content, right? So, um, and, one thing that's important to note here is that, like we're talking about, we're going to be using Unreal Engine as the primary vessel for everything we're going to be talking about today. But the Megascans ecosystem is designed in such a way to where it is completely renderer agnostic. So whether you're using Unreal Engine, whether you're going to be rendering in V-Ray, whether you're going to be using another real-time application, whatever it is, we actually have the SKUs for all those different uh, pieces of content that you're actually going to be able to bring into those applications. And we want it to be something to where any artist can drop in and just start being creative just about as fast as possible. So that's, again, just kind of the general philosophy behind the ecosystem and the way that we actually go about getting the content. So I'll just browse the collections here real quick so you guys can have an idea of some of the things that you might find in the library. So one thing that's really important to note here is that uh, is that uh, you, you'll notice a wide variety of different ecosystems here. And each of these different ecosystems uh, are are meticulously uh, curated by, we have librarians uh, is the way we like to kind of put it. So people that are constantly going out and scouting the earth, trying to figure out exactly what it is that we need to be filling the library with. And so one of the things that's important to note here is that we're always listening to the development community as well. So this is a really important point that I wanna stress because we're actually you know in communication with all the major developers in the games industry all the major film companies that are making movies and everything. And we're really trying to make sure that we're filling the library with stuff that's actually useful. Uh, we obviously examine the metadata associated with the library at, at a very meticulous level. So we're always going through seeing the types of things that people are actually downloading, the things that they're not downloading, right? So, um, you know, this is just a couple examples of some of those areas that you might see. So this is a scan trip, in fact, that I got to go on. Uh, we were just outside of Stockholm for this. And I actually got to scan a couple of these trees. In fact, it was a ton of fun to be able to just go and learn from the rest of the community or from the rest of our uh, scan team and actually just kind of see the process and actually get kind of get my hands dirty in the process too is a ton of fun. So this is just the type of content that you might see just for one of these collections here. So one of the things that you might notice here just to start browsing this basic collection here is that we have a wide variety of different asset types. So you'll see 3D assets, you'll see uh, tree trunks here, you'll see uh, these small little decals that you might use all over your environment, uh, lots of surfaces as well. So um, a wide variety of different asset types. But if you go to the home page, you can actually see kind of the main designations here for the different assets that we actually provide in the library. So um, 3D assets and 3D plants, obviously kind of representing kind of the 3D section of the library. So um, this is where you might be able to go in and find, you know, truly the most like photorealistic uh, vegetation that's available in the industry. This is where we kind of curate all that stuff. We have an amazing team that's actually making this content and using some really incredible workflows in order to break these assets down, break these plants down in real life, and then reconstruct them digitally, actually. Uh, so it's a really pretty cool process. So one of the questions that we get all the time, obviously, is, you know, you see a lot of articles online about, you know, oh, do photogrammetry at home, you know, do it on your iPhone or whatever. Uh, that's great. We know there's a lot of people that do that. And uh, we just think that we've kind of dialed it in a little bit. We've been working on it for a long time. We've been doing this for about nine years. Teddy, in fact, uh, one of our co-founders, he's actually been scanning for uh, over half his life. So he's been doing it for a very, very, very long time. Uh, and uh, it's pretty cool to see the process evolve. And also we're kind of expanding into these different types of content that we uh, that otherwise was just kind of a, a very humble offering at the beginning of the launch of Megascan. Uh, so now, you know, we're getting into drone scans, right, which is something that we're really, really excited about, about being able to mount our scanners onto these amazing uh, pieces of equipment and fly them around and actually get some truly incredible content like you might see with like this quarry cliff here. Um, if you guys got a chance to see the Unreal 5 demo that we released a couple months ago, 
uh, that was all content. Well, the, uh, the the natural parts of it specifically, those are assets that we specifically went and curated and developed and processed for that demo. So this is the type of thing that we're doing on a day to day basis is going out and actually filling projects. Obviously, this one's internally. It's a little bit easier. Right. But, you know, going out and actually filling the industry and with pro or filling the industry with with content that's actually useful for their projects. So this quarry cliff here, just as an example, is just something that you might see. Uh, from some of those new types of assets that we're actually curating. So some of this stuff here too, we just got a bunch of ice cliffs actually from an amazing trip. Uh, and so uh, there's just a bunch of different asset types in here. Uh, I definitely just encourage you guys to just browse around, you know, and the cool thing here too is that you can just jump up to the top, right? I can say, all right, I want to see, uh, you know, what's, what's come from Japan recently, right? And we had a scan trip from Japan last year. That was just amazing. And so here's some of the stuff that you might see uh, from that offering here. So uh, we want it to be a very visual experience. Obviously, this is one of the main, uh, the main, uh, the main pieces that we try to make, uh, you know, in all of our different applications is something that's very visual, something that's uh, very easy to sort of engage with. And so, uh, you know, we're obviously, you know, featuring these amazing renders of these assets, so you can get an idea of what it is that you're looking at. But you can also go in and actually start to inspect these, right? So you can actually break down the different masks or the different inputs here. Uh, be it albedo, normal, displacement, what have you. Um, and all that content is just available to browse this way. Now you can also, you could go a step further and actually I break this thing down and look at it here in 3D, see if it fits your purposes. And this is just right inside of the UI, which is really cool. It's a really nice way to start to look at the content and say, hey, does this fit my needs? Is this actually something that I think would work for what it is that I'm doing, right? Like a good example of this would be, you know, maybe be this, this Japanese wall here. So, you know, it's really important, obviously, for me to know before I download this, this is actually an open mesh, right? That's something that you wouldn't know unless you really got to spin this guy around before you actually downloaded it. Uh, so that's that's one thing that's really important to note here. Um, but it's a really cool way to start to go in and, you know, just be able to inspect these individual channels even, maybe look at one of the LODs and look at the different wireframes for those guys. Uh, so it's just a really neat way of kind of engaging with the content um, and sort of helps you before you sort of make that decision of actually exporting it into the engine. So uh, what you'll notice here in the UI here as well is that we do indicate scale. Uh, so this is kind of our little man here that stands next to the asset. And this will give you an indication of what the scale of this asset actually is. And then we also designate whether or not it's an open or closed mesh. This is something that's really important um, so that you have an understanding of what it is you're actually downloading before you actually get it. So uh, one of the things that's pretty cool actually is that we've had a lot of users in the community that have actually uh, taking a liking, obviously, to the offering and the 3D assets that are available to them. But one of the things that that uh, that they want to do is maybe manipulate the content in such a way to where maybe it isn't uh, an open asset. So a good example of this, let me just try to find something. I'll type in uh, Iceland here. So this is a really, really great section of the library. If you ever just get a chance to sort of browse through here, there's some amazing stuff. Uh, and this is one of the cool things here too, is that I can actually search and actually add in key features in order to kind of narrow down my search in a text format. So uh, one of the things you might notice here in sort of manipulating the content, right, is like you see this rock, this really, really kind of nice assembly here. Uh, it's actually grounded on uh, in some, some moss that's actually on the ground here. Now, there are applications and ways you can actually process this data in order to actually make it a closed mesh, right? So you can actually take it and kit bash it even more than just the way that it currently is with this skirt on it. So, um, you know, the way we like to think of the library is not necessarily just this truly plug and play solution to, oh yeah, that's the rock that I need. Let me put it into my scene and then walk away, you know, ship it, right? Um, we really like to think of the library as a jumping off point for artists where they can maybe take the content, maybe make some simple manipulations to it. And then from there, they're able just to be maximally creative uh, you know, either in Unreal Engine, using Mixer or what have you, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, but that's kind of the general philosophy there. Adam, any questions on anything so far? Or looking We're good? working on uh, curating some questions from the chat, but it, thanks for asking because I should say, guys, um, we're ready to take questions from you in the chat in context with uh, Galen's presentation. So don't feel like you got to hold back to the end. Uh, feel free to just start typing your questions in. Uh, my colleague, Miranda, who is producing uh, the stream and moderating the chat, she's going to collect the questions and feed them to me. And then, and then Galen, I can ask you as they come up. Awesome. 
Well, yeah, guys, don't don't be shy. Just jump right in here. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, so like I was kind of saying here, you know, one of the key tenets of the library here is that we want to make sure that it's really easy to get content directly into the application that you're working inside. So um, if you just look at any asset that you actually have downloaded already here, you'll notice that we have a wide variety of different applications you can export to, like we were talking about. And then for more custom solutions here as well, we have custom socket export, custom disk export. So maybe if you're working in a proprietary engine or something like that at work, that's a possibility as well here. Um, and then obviously for Unreal Engine, we're supporting all the way up to, you know, the most recent version of the engine uh, as per 425. And now we're actually, as since we're a part of Epic, we're able to actually make it so that day one, that our plugin is actually working for, you know, 426 when that comes out later this year. So uh, that's a really important thing to note here. So the other thing is that, uh, you know, like I was talking about, if you wanted to actually download the entire ecosystem of something that you were looking at, right? That's totally possible here inside of this application. I mean, you might need to go, you know, take a walk around the block a little bit, you know, depending on your internet speeds, obviously. Um, uh, but you come back and you can have the whole thing downloaded. And what's neat about it here too, is that you can actually isolate on a per asset type uh, exactly what settings you want for that, right? So I can look at my surfaces and I can say, all right, I know that I want, you know, whatever resolution all the way up through 8K for these different assets. Um, 3D models here as well. Uh, I can go in, I can isolate, you know, maybe the LOD specifically that I'm looking to export for this um, or the mesh format or what have you. Uh, so that's entirely possible just by going in here and actually affecting these global download settings or on a per asset basis, you could go in and just click one of these assets and you have obviously uh, the full range of um, options here as well. So just as an example of this, let me show you uh, maybe a piece before you would actually download it. So this is kind of a neat little asset here. So I can take a look at this download settings tab here on the side. This is an asset that I have not downloaded. And as you can see, we have lot zero through lot five. So we have a lot of different options here, depending on whatever SKU it is that you're working inside. So um, if you're shipping, you know, a triple A game uh, that you need, you know, some pretty beefy content, something that's actually, you know, really, really high res, you can get that from a higher lot. Uh, um, and then you can also get something that's way more optimized, you know, all the way down in this case, down to just 1100 tries. Um, so one of the other things that I'd like to point you guys to, and this is something just to sort of be aware for the future, is that, you know, I was talking a little bit about the Unreal Engine 5 demo uh, before we kind of got into this example here. But the high poly source asset here on the side is something that I definitely uh, keep an eye on because this is something that, uh, you know, when Unreal Engine 5 actually comes out, this is something that you guys are actually going to be able to use. So for this asset here specifically, I don't know exactly how many triangles it is, but it's in the several million triangle range. This is something that Unreal Engine 5 just slices through like butter, which is absolutely incredible. Um, I, I obviously come from a very traditional game development background, um, you know, learned very, very optimized game workflows when I was in college. This is something that just totally blows my mind. The fact that the engine can now handle ridiculous numbers of triangles and just it just it cuts through like butter, like I said. So this is something to be aware of uh, for for obviously next year. But uh, we're right around the corner from that. So uh, for right now, obviously, you know, using basic LODs is something that's good practice uh, for your projects. And, you know, if you're going to be starting out maybe on a mobile uh, in a mobile assignment for your first job or what have you, uh, you know, you still need to keep these these elements of performance sort of in the back of your mind. But uh, high poly source is definitely something to be aware. Of. And then we're going to continue to refine our scanning workflows so that the high poly source is even more accurate and true to life. So um, we're already planning for it, for what Nanite means for the future of the industry, and we're adjusting our scan methods accordingly. So, Hey, Galen, we've got a few questions that have come in. Yeah. Uh, uh, so the first one is from uh, J.D. Smith, DigiArtist, and he says, uh, uh, curious if they've been able to get into historical landmarks to scan, if they're going to be able to recreate monuments um, that have little public access. That's a great question. So... Um, this is actually a great section to look at here. So I just typed in Roman into the search bar here at the top. Uh, so this is an element uh, that we're really, really excited about this type of scanning specifically of actually partnering very closely with companies that might be, or institutions rather, that might be looking to preserve history in some regard. And so this is an example of a bunch of Roman assets that we were able to curate for the library. 
And what was amazing about this is that we actually had access to a museum after hours. They roped off the area for us. Uh, we were able to actually move things away from the wall, get behind it and actually scan it. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is something that we're really excited about. This is a really neat way of actually sort of preserving history in a way as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And we were able to even get, you know, like these types of like statues and stuff like that, which is just amazing. Right. That's so cool. Yeah. So we're, we're always looking for more partners that want to help us in this area. Um, you know, every museum, every country sort of has their own sort of ideas about this. And so, uh, you know, the work, the hard work itself, honestly, for us is more on the legal side of things, <laughs> as opposed to the actual scanning part of it. We've got the scanning part down, um, but navigating legally, you know, some of this stuff is definitely something that, uh, that we've, we've, we've learned a lot from the process, I would say. Um, but every, every country, every museum, every, you know, contact is different. So, um, but yeah, and just a note on that real quick is that everything here that's in the library is obviously a hundred percent free of copyright. So you guys do not need to worry about that at all. This is not the wild west of turbo squid. Uh, everything on here is something that you can use directly in your project. So Awesome. Uh, you, it, it, is it okay? Take a few more questions right now. Of course, yeah. All right, cool. Um, uh, Vole Motion asks, uh, do the plants, leaves, and assets with moss and grass come with translucency maps? They do. Yes, they do. Awesome. And then uh, we've got uh, Jonathan Mueller asks, I use Blender to make my own assets. What kind of workflow do you think would be best on managing a custom library using Mixer? Or would that be kind of overkill? I don't think it's overkill at all. I mean, I think, you know, project management is something that obviously employers really uh, appreciate, especially from, you know, younger hires, I would say. Uh, so I would definitely encourage you to lean into, you know, organization on the front end of your career as much as you can so that when you do go into that first job that you have a leg up against someone who might not has ever really thought about, you know, uh, organization for a project whatsoever. Every single project they have is on their desktop, right? That's not how games work. That's not how films work, right? So um, being a little uh, more proactive in that regard, I think is a great thing. Um, we're actually making some functionality to actually use Bridge as a repository for your own content as well. You can actually bring in custom content right now. Um, and we're expanding that tool set even more I would say like over the coming months in order to sort of make that a better offering because we do have uh, smaller teams that maybe just don't have the resources to try to figure out that asset management pipeline. And so they're actually using our application as kind of a jumping off point. But we want to support that, obviously. There's some really important features in there like source control being kind of the primary one, uh, you know, that we want to start to engage, you know, with this application specifically. Uh, so that's the type of stuff that we have sort of on the horizon. All right, and then we've uh, this kind of completes my backlog uh, up until now. Alan Torp uh, Jensen wants to know: Can you send an asset from Bridge directly to Mixer and back? You can. Yeah, it's uh, it's super easy actually. But one of the things that's really nice actually about this is you don't even necessarily need to do that. So if you just go over here on the export side, um, you can just kick it directly into Mixer using this, um, and it's really easy to do that. But one thing to note once we jump over to Mixer actually is that your local library, as long as it just has the same location on your drive, actually mirrors the exact same thing that you're going to see inside of Bridge. So you don't even necessarily need to do that if you don't want to. Awesome. All right. That takes care of all the questions I've got up till now. And we'll take some time to build up another backlog of questions. So guys, keep, uh, keep it coming. Cool. All right. So, um, so yeah, I think... I think we should just start making some stuff. I think I've talked for too long. I think we should just start making some pretty pictures and start bringing it into the engine so that you guys can actually uh, see some results here. So um, I'm gonna jump into Mixer to start. Um, and this is an application, again, like I said, it's entirely free for you guys to use. Um, and it's very similar to what it was that we were sort of looking at with Bridge in regard to the entire library sort of being here at your fingertips. So one of the things that I love about this application specifically is that this to me is just the way that texturing always should have been, right? Which is, which is just having access to this huge library of assets that you can just pull from, grab anything off the shelf, start dragging into your project, retexture something very quickly. This is something that is just really, really easy to do inside this application. So like I said, it mirrors the entire Megascans library. 
Um, you know, we have 3D functionality, surfaces, decals, every single thing, and you can just start to mix and match those different pieces directly into your project and start making stuff. Um, so one of the things that's really cool, right? So just like a really, really basic example here, if I were to type in dirt. So dirt, you know, and I'll isolate like surface just so we can see some of the different dirt surfaces. So one of the things that's kind of neat about this application is just, you know, you look at some of the things that are in here and imperfections are in here too, which is pretty cool. But, uh, and we'll get to that. But, uh, you know, what would it look like, you know, for maybe this asset here to be mixed with, I don't know, you know, just any other asset in here, right? Um, being able to just very, very quickly have an idea of what those two different materials would look like if they were to be stacked on top of each other. Maybe I make some basic manipulations, uh, change the roughness values, maybe ma match the albedo slightly. Um, these are all things that you can do in seconds inside this application. So um, I'm going to do a couple different examples here for you guys today. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll start kicking into the engine and then we'll jump into 3D as well. Um, so that's kind of the general rundown of everything that I'm hoping to do here. So we'll try to get through all of that uh, pretty quickly here. So what I want to do to start is I want to grab, uh, like I said, I want to see what these two different services might look like on top of each other and actually do a very, very simple mix here with just the general surface workflow. So the way that Mixer works is that it's basically an application that's based on height blending. And that's just one of the ways, obviously, that you can get these different uh, pieces to engage with each other. But um, this is kind of the, the, the main thrust of the application is being able to layer on a bunch of different materials onto whatever it is that you're working on, whether it's just a surface like a plane or if it's actual 3D asset. Uh, and then we can mix and match, blend, uh, and do a bunch of different things with that uh, just very simply inside of the application. So one of the things that's amazing about this is that uh, we've solved tiling in real time here in the viewport. So I can offset this material in X and Y, right? I can rotate uh, the asset. I can do whatever I want just to get a completely different look of this guy. And if I hit T on the keyboard, then I can actually see what that tiling representation looks like at any time. So as you can see, um, you know, I made some manipulations to this in, in zero to one space and it just continues to tile. So that speaks to obviously the nature of the tiling uh, functionality of everything that you can download inside the library, but also just the application being able to sort of handle this. So let me give you sort of another example of what this could potentially look like. So if I just drag in a paint layer into my, into my scene and I start to paint across the seams of this, what you'll notice is if I T on the keyboard, everything that I just did across albedo, metalness, roughness, and displacement actually carries over. So it continues to tile, even though all I've done here is just paint, you know, across the seams. So it's really, really easy to go in and start making these types of manipulations. Um, this obviously isn't very aesthetically pleasing here, so I'm going to kill that paint layer. But you get the general idea is that everything that I'm going to be doing uh, inside of this application is something that will allow me to continue to maintain a tiling component to this mix. So let's just let's just show this in practice here. So I want to drag in this dry, rocky ground material here. So I'll show this guy real quick. So this is what this material looks like. And so what I was saying, right, is being able to sort of quickly blend between these two different materials and just sort of see what that looks like. So what I'll do is I'll just drag this guy to the top of the stack. And as you can see here, if I affect my threshold of this, you'll see that I'm bringing that material up to the bottom. I'll zoom in here so you guys can kind of see it here. But we're getting that dirt from below to actually start to peek through the bottom parts here. And we can actually see it uh, now represented in the mix. So if I hit two on the keyboard, I can see what my albedo looks like. And I can go through the different number of keys here and actually see what all the different inputs are if you want to just use those hot keys really quickly. But so what I want to what I want to show you guys is how we can sort of homogenize these these different elements to sort of make something brand new. So what you can do here on the side just one of the manipulations, one of the many manipulations you can do is affect the radius. So as you can see, what this is doing is basically creating uh, more of a more of a soft or hard transition, depending on which way I'm actually sliding this. So radius is a really, really neat slider to start messing around with with this type of uh, manipulation here. But one of the things that I can do is actually even wipe out some of the, the, the normal detail or the displacement detail from down below by using the blur underline feature here. So this will actually wipe out anything uh, that we're seeing from down below. And then the wrap to underline feature actually does exactly that, which is that it wraps basically the scan that I'm manipulating right now to what it is that's below it. 
So this is just a really, really nice way to start manipulating this and try to get something new and unique. And it, like I said, if I hit T on the keyboard at any time, I can actually see what that tiling preview looks like and it's continuing to tile, which is just awesome. So let's continue to sort of go down that path and I'll just sort of offset this rock texture in X and Y. And you can see just how easy it is for me to sort of get something brand new right there. And it continues to tile all the way through the example. So um, I'll go through here and just sort of show some of the other things. So obviously you can affect the number of repetitions here as well. So if I wanted to change, uh, maybe have this repeat, you know, more in a certain axis, I can do that here as well. Um, so that's entirely up to the project of, you know, the needs of the project that you're working on. I can offset this like we were looking at. So I can actually have more or less of this scan maybe in a certain area if I want to. Um, I can rotate it. I can change the albedo value here so I can go up and down and try to get something that maybe is a little bit closer to what it is that I'm working with. That's one way you could do it just by using uh, just the general sampling color here. We also have an eyedropper tool, which is really nice to be able to just go in and start sampling anything that's actually in the entire UI, which is kind of nice. So you can do that if you would like. Um, we could go in here and start to affect maybe the roughness of this. So maybe I want these rocks to maybe have just a little bit more uh, shiny value to them than what they had before. So that's something that you can do here as well. Uh, but one of the ways I want to start to homogenize this mix really quickly here, and I'll isolate the albedo so you can see exactly what I mean, is that right now we actually have a little bit of a separation between these two dirt textures just in the basic value uh, that they kind of have right now. So what I'll do is if I hover over the albedo uh, swatch right here, if I middle click on it, what this will do is actually find, uh, this will actually go in and create uh, what is basically just an average of these. So if I just middle click over this, then what that will do is actually go in and start to allow me to change this and find that nice sort of middle ground if I would like. So I can go in here and start to find something that's a little bit more uh, close to what it is that I'm going for. And maybe I want just like enough of a separation here to where we, we know that these are maybe two different types of dirt, uh, but that's something that you can do here very, very quickly here in order to kind of get something completely different. Um, so we've got that. Uh, let's see, what else can I show here real quick? So we've got our height frequency value here. So this is a really, really nice thing to start manipulating where maybe I want maybe more of these big rocks to jump through the bottom. So it bumps up those low frequency values and I can actually get maybe the bigger rocks that pop through the bottom. Uh, conversely, you have the high frequency value here where I can go in and maybe get some more of those crunchy details uh, to kind of come through the bottom here as well. So. Again, this is one of those things that depending on what it is that you're mixing, you might find some happy accidents just in sort of manipulating those low frequency values to get something that's just completely different. So I would definitely encourage you guys to take a look at that as well. Okay, so um, we have a couple of different asset types here that you can bring into the scene here as well. So you can bring in solid layers if this is something that you want to do. Um, the reason I bring up the solid layers specifically is because this is something that uh, you could use maybe in like a masking way here. So I could actually maybe create like a composite blend between these different guys and bring them into the engine that way if I would like. Um, so that's something you could do. Um, also, uh, I'll pull up real quick just another tutorial here on the side just so that you guys can reference to it later. Um, let me just pull this up real quick. So a question we get all the time is how do I stylize Megascan's assets? You know, they're obviously photoreal in nature, um, but I want to maybe kind of make something that's a little bit more stylized. So this is something that you could definitely do here. Um, you could, so this is a tutorial that we recorded uh, just to be able to kind of show this exact workflow of, you know, taking Megascan's assets, stylizing them slightly. And this is using that solid layer uh, example here. So I'll just kind of fast forward here so we see the example of what we actually texture here. So this is that example here of a very stylized rock that was sculpted and then just kind of using nothing but solid layers in order to actually get uh, the desired result. So that's entirely something that you could do if you would like um, using solid layers, um, you know, just using some basic edge highlights and that type of thing. Um, and we'll kind of get into that on the 3D side of things here as well. But solid layer is super important. It's definitely a really, really uh, uh, important thing to sort of understand and be aware of uh, with this application. Um, and super powerful. So um, another thing that you can do here on the side here is that we have this noise layer. And this noise layer is really kind of a neat tool if we want to add in some basic undulation into the surface. So I can affect the amplitude of this, affect the frequency of this as well, 
maybe change the octaves and then just kind of generally find something. And this is just totally mesmerizing, right? Like, there you go. That's perfect. That's exactly what I was going for. So um, you could really kind of take this uh, any way you want. Um, but what's nice about this is being able to sort of maybe add in a slight amount of undulation in the surface that you otherwise wouldn't have with this scan. And it continues to tile, obviously, which is really convenient. Um, but just having even just that slight amount of undulation in the surface is something that sometimes is really, really valuable. Um, so I definitely encourage you guys to sort of explore this. Uh, take a look at some of the things you can do with it. It's a really, really powerful aspect. Um, you can also bring in decals. This is something that's really exciting here. So uh, if I click on the decals button here at the top, you can see I have a couple different decals here already downloaded, so I'll probably just use one of these. But if you go here into the online section and you just look at atlases, um, atlases, decals, uh, kind of the same. And uh, so the idea here is I could bring in any one of these into my scene and actually start to just uh, add in some maybe slight variation into the surface. Uh, maybe use these decals directly into my project or into my environment, like these manhole covers or um, some of these ornaments or maybe just these painted parking lines, something really, really simple like that. Um, something that just goes and breaks up the surface really easily. Um, or these kind of dusty concrete patches are a ton of fun to just throw on walls, you know, and kind of add some, some variation on the surface that way. So there's a lot of different ways you can sort of work with it. Um, but what I'm going to use here for this example is actually use this dried grass and leaves texture here. I want to add in a little bit of this dried grass directly onto the surface here. So as you can see, what's neat about this is if I hit T in the keyboard, you can see it continues to tile, but this is actually an element that has transparency associated with it. So uh, this is just going to layer right on top of what it is that I'm working with. So I could add, you know, I can set the blend to from below here. And then now as I start to sort of bring this guy in, as you can see, it's only sort of appearing in those recessed areas, which is really, really nice. And then again, I could go into the albedo here. I can middle click on it and it'll find an average of it. So it'll just like find a really, really nice value right in the middle here. It will just blend it in really nicely onto the surface. So that's one way that you could sort of use decals and sort of and sort of breaking up uh, the existing mix that you have going here. Let me turn on my fan really quick. Stand by. All right. Cool. So uh, the last thing that I want to do, uh, just to show you guys this real quick, is that I can add in a liquid layer, and this is kind of a fan favorite, I would say. Uh, but the liquid layer, if I just drag this guy in here, is that what I'll do is I can just bring up the threshold of this now. And as you can see, we have really easy puddles that have just formed directly into this mix. Um, so this is kind of just a really neat way of breaking up uh, an, your mix and just kind of add in another uh, element of sort of these nice reflections that you could get in your environment. Um, so what's neat about this here too is that we have some features here. So we could go in, you know, I could say, all right, maybe I want this to be, I don't know, some type of, crazy like radioactive green or something like that. You could do that if you'd like. Um, what's nice here too is that we have a moisture threshold here. So if I zoom in sort of where the the actual water meets the uh, meets the dirt here, I could go in and I can affect the, the threshold of that. So maybe we get that to bleed out a little bit more past the surface of where there's actually contact. So that's something that's really, really nice. Very, very useful here as well. Um, I could change the depth of the water here as well. So maybe have more or less of that surface actually be visible um, from the reflection there. So uh, a lot of really cool features here. I'm just going to sort of leave it as is here because I think this is uh, kind of a decent result here just to just to kind of start. But uh, that's kind of the, the basic rundown of sort of creating uh, a simple sort of surface. And as you can see, we started, you know, just from something really basic here. Probably just this is a little bit more accurate here. So this guy is kind of where we started, right? And then we started making some manipulations to this. And then uh, just really just in minutes, we have something that's completely different from what we started with. And that's kind of the general idea behind mixers is being able to just mash a couple things together, bring it into your project and see how it looks. So um, let's obviously bring into the engine so we can see just how easy it is to bring that content in. So first of all, I'm going to save because I know I'm probably giving someone anxiety out there. So um, we'll just kind of do this real quick. Um, and we'll go ahead and say add this to the project and we'll say save. Cool. And what I'll do is I'll actually go file, export to library. So this is one of the ways that you can actually export something. 
Uh, what I'm going to do though is I'm going to I'm going to take this a step further here. What I want to do, I'm going to export it 4K, um, just so that we have something uh, a little bit more crispy when we bring into the engine. So this is something that's really important to note actually here as well, is that um, Mixer is entirely non-destructive application. So what that means is that let's say you're working on your potato laptop on the road, you don't have power, whatever, um, and you 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 need to sort of be working at a low resolution uh, with that work PC that you have uh, on the go. Now, if I have a really, really nice machine, maybe on campus or at my job or at home or what have you, I can use this application in such a way to where I can work non-destructively. Say I want to edit at you know 1024 by 1024 or 2K by 2K or what have you, and I can export all the way up to 8K as long as I have all the source actually on my drive. That's one of the things that's just really awesome uh, to be able to do using this application. And um, it's definitely something to sort of future-proof your workflow and also save your GPU a little bit. So um, just kind of a nice little tidbit about the application there. Um, the other thing I want to show here is that I want to actually, uh, now what I'm going to do is actually export a dry version of this. And the reason I'm going to do this is because what I want to do now is actually show, show you guys how easy it is to create a blend inside of the editor with these two mixes that we just made. So one with the puddle and one without. And then we'll just create a very, very simple blend inside of the engine um, using the Megascans plugin. So this is just exporting right now into Bridge. So one thing to note here as well is that you can export this way. You can bring it in and uh, kind of like the question that we got earlier in the presentation, actually, um, using Bridge as a central repository, using it as a library um, is definitely something that you can do. So you can bring it into this application, sort of use it there to where you can export it out into whatever application you need. Or on the side here, you can just export individual channels, maps, what have you. And this is a fully customizable experience. So if I want to go in and maybe create, you know, uh, roughness, metalness, and ambient occlusion uh, composite, I can do that here. It's really, really easy to go in and just start to change, you know, all right, I want ambient occlusion to go in the red channel, what have you. It's really, really easy. Um, I can change the color space here to linear as well, as if that's something you guys need to do. Um, and then obviously the custom format, you know, exporting out into whatever it is that you need, all the way up through the gold standard of 32-bit EXR. That's something you can do here as well. So um, we're going to be using Bridge, and I'll sort of show you why. So this is the this is the mix that we just made here uh, inside of Bridge, and I can preview it here. It's kind of neat. You can take a look at it. Um, I can obviously change the different resolutions if I want to sort of preview it and then inspect the individual channels here as well. Um, but what I'm going to do is actually export these now directly into the engine. So uh, real quick, I'll just show you my Unreal Engine scene here real quick. I don't have anything in the scene. There's nothing fancy going on here at all. Um, I just have the Unreal Engine, uh, well, the Megascans plugin for Unreal Engine. So that, and you'll notice that this beautiful green button here is at the top of the UI. Um, I won't show you guys how to install this. It's a very, very simple process. I'll show you a tutorial. You can look at it later if you want. Um, but it's very simple to install. Um, and all this is doing is basically communicating back to Bridge and saying, hey, I'm seeing everything that you're doing. I like it. Let's start you know, doing some things with the, the content that you're going to start bringing in here now. So we have this application uh, running in the background, basically, and it's communicating with Unreal Engine. And so this is where we can start to make some cool things happen. So. Um, I'm going to start here by making sure, uh, obviously, the plugin is installed, and I want displacement turned on. That's really all I'm going to be doing to make sure that I have displacement turned on for this surface example. So I'll go back into Bridge here, and uh, I'm just going to export these directly into my project. So I'll export these two assets. And so, as you can see here in the top right, it's exporting to Unreal Engine. And if I tab back over to Unreal Engine, this is it bringing in all this content sort of behind the scenes. So you might wonder yourself, well, how does it know? How does it know what it is that I'm supposed to be importing? How does it know, you know where things are supposed to go? Well, it's really smart, in fact. So what it does is all it's doing is basically pointing to a material that we actually ship with our plugin. And this material has a designation for albedo, normal, roughness, displacement, everything that you need in order to assemble uh, these materials, right? I'm sure you guys are familiar with the idea of material instances, so I don't want to kind of uh, dig down too deep into that concept. But the basic idea is that material instances 
uh, make it really easy for you to make real-time changes inside the viewport um, with a really, really simple uh, set of switches, basically. Um, and so what we're doing is just the application itself has a master material that it's pointing to, and that master material is going to create a new instance based on what it is that we're bringing into the engine now. All right, so as you can see here, we've got our... Oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. No, we've got some more questions kind of built up um, in the chat um, because this is really cool. Everything you're showing us is amazing. Um, so I'm going to, awesome. let's see, I'm going to grab a question from this. A little bit of a troubleshooting question, if that's okay right now. Um, let's see. Sure. They're asking, currently, if I send any asset to Maya using Bridge, uh, the Megascan plugin does not make the Arnold shader properly. Um, like it usually does not connect displacement to the shader at all. Is this by design or is there some sort of complications um, that I'm doing via, via the plugin or, or so forth? Um, that one I don't know specifically. That's, uh, that's definitely something we have to look at with support. Yeah. I mean, it's supposed yeah. to work. <laughs> okay. um, I would say the only thing you know to be aware of is to make sure, um, and this, you know, this is, just to make sure you're doing everything the right way is to have everything downloaded that you need. I know that's, I don't know, it's, it's basic, but like make sure you have everything downloaded that you need in order to assemble that material, right? A lot of times, like you might just click a couple things like, oh, I want this and this and this, or maybe you didn't even indicate, you know, that you wanted displacement or what have you, um, or, you know, the right type of color space or whatever. So just double check all the things that you've downloaded, all your settings there before you kick it in there. Uh, just to make sure that it's actually doing, uh, it can actually do the thing you want it to do. Um, that would be where I would start. And if you're still running into issues, definitely take up a ticket with support because it's supposed to work. <laughs> and that in and of itself is pretty cool, right? Like you're using an entirely free asset <laughs> that's being provided. Um, and then you can also take out a ticket with support to ask a question about what you're doing with it. I mean, that's a, that's an amazing service. Yeah. Um, Joe Jacobs in the chat uh, wants to know, are there any VDB assets of fog, smoke, or clouds available? That's a great question. <clears throat> um, not currently. Uh, it's, um, it's not easy to scan that stuff. In fact, I don't know if anyone's actually done it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really hard. Um, so yeah, not right now, but we have in the engine itself, I mean, volumetric clouds and like the whole like sun, sky, atmosphere stuff that just went into the engine is absolutely incredible. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at that yet, that's as of 425. Um, and we have a lot more features coming in 426 specifically around that idea. I would investigate that stuff if you haven't already, for sure. Yeah, I remember when, um, at least when Megascans popped up on my radar, there was a, just a beautiful demo that was created using a lot of the Iceland assets. Mm -hmm. um, so some gorgeous animations with like mist coming up in between the rocks and, and so forth. It's really, really incredible what the engine itself can do. Um, we did that in Houdini. Uh, so those, okay, Houdini, gotcha. those were flip cards uh, that were made in Houdini. And then we brought them in basically, um, you know, as these really, really amazing systems in order to sort of create that separation, like you're talking about the parallax between the rocks and everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, amazing stuff, though. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, another question. Alan Torp Jensen, uh, again, wanting to know, how would you modify texture on the original 3D asset in Mixer? For example, if I want to remove the moss from the ancient Temple Stone 3D asset, is there, is it, is it, he wants to know, is this like a Photoshop thing that he'd have to do? Or is there a way to do that from within? Yeah, I, I'll actually demo that specifically. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Um, well, we can continue and we'll build up a few more questions as we go. Cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, so what I was going to show here real quick is actually just taking these two materials now, because I, what I have is I could drag, you know, just this basic material onto this plane that I have in my scene here. And that's, you know, we could call that done. Um, but what I want to do is actually create a really nice blend between these two and actually show some displacement as well. So what I'll do is I'll select these two material instances that we just created based on the mix that we just made inside a mixer. And at the bottom of the Megascans plugin here, you'll see this create material blend button. And so with these two material instances selected, I'll say create material blend. 
And then up in the top here of my uh, blend materials folder, we have this brand new material that just got created. So it doesn't look like anything here uh, yet, but what we're gonna do is sort of crack this guy open, take a look at some of the features that it has and start to very quickly make some basic manipulations to make this look even better. So um, one thing you'll notice here by default here is that this is not displaced. It is flat as a board. So that's not great. Uh, we want to actually get some displacement here. So uh, this is actually built into the shader uh, that we have uh, out of the box. So I'll just start by adding in some subdivisions here. And if I increase my displacement offset, what you'll see is that now we're getting that really, really nice crispy uh, displacement on the surface. So that's a really, really cool feature to be able to have just to be able to get something that's exactly what it was that we were just looking at inside of Mixer. And in fact, this is actually at a higher resolution. We were mixing it at 2K and we just kicked it up to 4K. That's why it kind of took a little bit longer to import here. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is this is that same exact material that we were just mixing, right? So we've got the nice like dried grass and leaves texture here and sort of the, the recessed areas. We've got our puddles, obviously. They're making some awesome reflections. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we can build our reflection captures real quick here, and then we'll sort of get a more accurate representation of what this looks like. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, we can go in, and now what I wanna show, since we created this blend material, is actually show what it looks like to blend between these two. So um, this is just a plane, nothing fancy, uh, but what I'm gonna do here is go into the mesh paint feature, and then actually go into the paint component and I'm going to set my radius to something reasonable here, like 200. And the way that this works is that the blend material is basically running on a per channel sort of fashion. So what that means is that each vertice inside of the engine stores data associated with it. So uh, red, green, blue, and the alpha obviously store basically a binary on off. Yes, this has, uh, vertex colors or no, it does not. So white, if it does, black, if it does not. And from there, we're able to paint uh, this directly into the viewport. So what I'll show is I'm just gonna paint on red because we only have two, but if I just start to paint now directly on this, what you'll see is that these puddles are now going away because we're blending between the version with puddles and the version without. So now, you know, I've painted this guy up. So now we have no puddles whatsoever. And then I can reintroduce them here in seconds. And this is a really, really cool way to start customizing your environments, uh, really make them just that much more special, right? Like painting so that you don't see obvious tiling, obvious repetition and that type of thing. So that is something that's really cool. Um, and like you saw, we just did that in seconds here. So um, I'll open up the material here so you guys can see that here as well. So this is the material that actually ships uh, directly with the plugin. So this is the instance that's created. If I go down to the parent, this is what that looks like. It's nothing crazy by any stretch of the imagination. If you guys want, you can obviously take this as a starting place. You could go and start manipulating this. You can make it your own, add in your own features to it, but you can use this as a starting place if you want. Um, so that's one of the cool things about working with this plugin is that you guys have access to all this right now. You can literally take this, start using it in your project today. Um, so don't be ashamed of sort of taking this math and sort of making it your own and sort of, uh, making it work for your purposes here. That's the reason that we put it in. So there's a lot of other features, uh, inside of this specific material here. I won't have time to go over all of them. Uh, but I would just start to poke around. I think that's one of the cool things about this is being able to just go in and start to say, all right, you know, like what are some of these things do like do I want to I can go and change you know the color overlay if I want to um, sort of make it fit with my environment that's something that I can do really easily um, you know I could go in uh, maybe the base roughness I want to change the base roughness here maybe change that um, you know I could change the normal intensity here too I can make that you know maybe higher so zero or one or what have you um, so you could go in and start to customize stuff like that uh, there's a lot of different things that you can do here to start customizing this but I would just mess around. That's how I learned to work with shaders is look at something that's way more complex and just start working backwards, right? Like the cool thing about sort of working, especially, you know, with something that maybe looks a little bit daunting, you know, to start 
is that you could just maybe start at the top and just like for Albedo, here's an example. I could go in and maybe just plug this in, right? Put that directly into Albedo and then learn everything that comes before it and then start to incorporate some of these other things. All right, so what does that look like when it's actually plugged into the blend? What does that look like you know, when it's actually going back here to the, the UV setup here on the side? That's a really, really great way of learning. Um, so don't feel too intimidated when you open up something like this. It's always uh, worth poking around stumbling around a little bit here it's not going to be easy um, but you know you can go in and start to maybe preview this as well uh, so you can enable real-time real preview you know for in, each of these individual nodes so you can actually kind of get an idea of what some of these functions do um, that's the best way to start learning this type of stuff so but yeah so that's the basic surface workflow so i think what we'll do is actually jump now into the 3D side of things. Cool. While you're setting that up, I've got a, a question that's yeah. a little more oriented towards what we just saw on Surface. Uh, Renderman Pro is asking, um, what is a good technique to break the tile effect in Mixer? And he says, for example, um, if you're not doing something by two, point, two by two meters, but more on like a 100 by 100 meter scale um, to break up some of the tiling. Great question. Um, you know, for something that big, to be honest with you, I would likely use a landscape actor inside of the engine. I wouldn't try to make a mix that's 100 by 100 meters. Um, that would be my advice. I know it's not directly answering your question, but that's that's what I would do instead, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And then let's see. Actually, we've got the next couple of questions are more 3D oriented. So I'll let you kind of get into what you've got set up next, and then we'll uh, bring those up. It sounds good, yeah. Well, so I want to use this guy as kind of our basic jumping off point. Um, so I think to sort of address, you know, the question that we got about maybe removing certain elements that we didn't like uh, for a scan. So let's say that my director comes to me, right, and says, hey, you know, we're, we're making this scene. We're going to be using this actor specifically. Maybe we got it back from outsourcing or something, or maybe you made it. Um, and uh, you need to make some changes to it. So let's say that we wanted to quickly retexture this guy. Super easy. Why don't we do that here really quick? So like I said, uh, you know, we have the entire Megascans library at our fingertips here. It's one of the coolest parts of sort of working in this way. It is texturing literally the way that I think the texturing always should have been. I don't know why it wasn't like this before. It's so cool to see this. So what I'll do is just add in a surface layer here to start. Uh, and I'll type in stone. Let's see what we have in the stone category. Uh, maybe rock. We'll see what we have in the rock category. So uh, these are just assets that I have locally. So I want to make sure we're not downloading anything to save everybody some time here. So I like a lot of this stuff that's going on here. Maybe I'll just grab this guy. I like this smooth rock here. And I want to just retexture this here really quick uh, just to sort of show how easy it is to kind of do it. So one of the things that's really cool about working in this application now is that we've actually included hexaplanar projection into uh, the application. So what does that mean here? So um, originally, you know, triplanar projection was like a big thing, obviously, when it came into the industry. Uh, and what's really nice about that is that it basically shoots materials up in three different planes. So now we have that in uh, more than three planes, which is pretty exciting. So what that looks like here is taking this, this uh, material here that's tiling and it wraps directly on the surface and does not does not affect seams in any way. This is a completely seamless approach to texturing here now. So, and what we can do is we can go and customize this even more. So we can affect the radius of it. We have height influence here as well. Uh, and then we can affect the scale of this. So as you can see, as I start to change the projection of this, right, it's adjusting on the fly to what it is that we're getting. So. Uh, what's nice about this here is, as you can see, we're continuing to tile always, which is really amazing here, obviously. Um, but now we can start to make some changes to this in order to sort of get something that's maybe more in line with what it is that we were just working with. So, uh, you know, I'm going to bring this guy maybe a little bit darker here. So now what I'm going to do here really, really quickly, and I just want to show how easy it is. Uh, I'll go through it very quickly and then we'll break it down very fast or very, very slowly. Um, but I just want to show how easy it is to sort of take this, use it as a base, um, and retexturing something very quickly, and then be able to, you know, go to your director, you know, a minute later, 
and be able to show, all right, I did the thing. Uh, so what I want to do here uh, to sort of get this looking good is I want to do a couple of things. Um, I want to bump the edges a little bit. Maybe I want to add in a little bit of moss. I think there should be some moss in here. Maybe that's one of the notes that he gave me. Uh, we, sh we should have some moss maybe in the cavities and maybe on sort of an up vector approach to this. And then also maybe let's bring in uh, a different rock from the bottom. Maybe this base should just be a completely different rock altogether. So why don't we go through and do those things really quickly. I'll show you just how easy it is to do that. So I'll add in another rock here and I want this one to be something that's maybe a little bit more crispy and I'll bring in this granite rock and this is going to be my edge highlight. So like we were mentioning before, uh, I can go in here and I can affect the scale of this guy so we can get it maybe more in line with what it is that we're trying to get. So maybe something like this, it's a little bit more crispy and I can middle click on this and I can get something that matches that, that same sort of value down below, which is really nice. But now I need to mask this, right? Like it's just on the surface entirely. It doesn't have any breakup. So we have mask stats. This is something I haven't covered yet. Um, but like I said, I'm going to move through this very quickly and then we'll deconstruct it. So I'll add in a mask stack and I want to add in a curvature component as my mask. So what this is going to do, if I hit nine on the keyboard, I can see what this mask is actually doing and I can affect it in real time. So if I just go back to my PBR preview here and I affect my levels here, you can see that now this curvature component is actually changing live in the viewport. So if I hit nine again on the keyboard, you can see exactly what this is doing, but I can go in and really drown out everything here just except for those, those edges. So I'll change the value of this so we can see it a little bit better here as well. I want to maybe bump it slightly so I can bring it up more here. So now it's actually bumping those edges really, really nice. Um, and I can go in and still obviously, you know, bump maybe the high frequency values of this guy, uh, maybe change, you know, the scale at any time here is where we get that to look a little bit different. Um, but I think this is looking pretty decent so far just to get a basic edge highlight. So the next thing I'm going to do is add in that moss. So we'll add in some moss here like this moss actor here we'll bring it in i'm going to change the scale of this really quickly and now i want this to do a couple things i want it first of all to actually adhere to the crevices now so i can add in a mask stack i'll use curvature again but this time instead of using default curvature i'll use cavities only and so what this is going to do is actually just put it directly in the cavity so if i hit nine on the keyboard like we we're looking at you can see now it's actually going directly in the cavity. So it's the inverse of what we were just doing. <clears throat> and I can now do a levels adjustment of this, maybe make it so that it's maybe heavier handed here or less, um, which is really nice. And I can affect the tightness here as well. And then also anti-aliases, right? Which is a nice feature here. So we de-speckle some of the stuff that's going on. It's also a soft mesh. So why don't we use that option here as well? So soft mesh just sort of makes it so that it doesn't adhere to otherwise very rigid edges and that type of thing. So we get a nice softer effect uh, than what we were looking at before. And now we've got some really nice moss here. So that looks pretty good. But my director was saying, hey, I want you to actually add in some moss on the top side of this as well. So what we can do is we can stack these effects on top of each other. This is one of the coolest parts about working in Mixer is that it's sort of a combination of working inside of Photoshop and working in an application like 3D Studio Max that has a stack in it. So it's sort of the best of both of those worlds. That's kind of the best way I like to sort of explain it. So what I'll do is I'll add in a normal component now. And if I had nine on the keyboard, what you'll see here is that this is now basically projecting from one side. It's saying, all right, there's only moss on this side. Well, that's not exactly what we're going for. But what's cool here is that we have this radial slider to where we can go and actually affect exactly which direction it's actually going to go. So we want it to go top down. So this is exactly what we're going for here. We want it to go top down and we can affect the range here slightly to where now we've got this completely adhering to exactly what it is that we we're trying to get. So now we've got top down projection. So the normal is actually working in that way. But what you'll notice here is that this is actually stomping the work that we just did down below. So it's actually not adhering to the curvature. We want to add this. So we have blending modes inside of this stack. So we can add this now, or we can overlay it. You know, we can get exactly what it is that we're trying to get just directly on top of this so that now we get the best of both of these worlds directly on top of each other. So if I had nine in the keyboard here, now you can see that we have the curvature as well as the normal directly on top of each other. So that is pretty sweet to be able to have that as uh, something that we can sort of work these two different uh, components sort of working together, which is really, really nice to have. So 
Um, we also want to add in uh, another stone material. That was the other note that we got. So I bring in some rock. Why don't we bring in another one? We'll bring in this Icelandic rock. I don't know exactly what this one looks like, but we'll try it. All right, so there's that. This one's a little bit uh, more speckled. This is actually perfect. This is actually what I was kind of going for. So um, what we'll do is sort of adjust the scale of this. And let's say we just want this base pillar here to be what's actually uh, the new material. So I'm going to change the albedo here to maybe bring it more in line with some of the other elements that we have here. Um, but now I'm going to use a different masking component. So I'll add in a mask stack. And this time I'm actually going to use a position gradient. And so if I hit 9 on the keyboard, what you'll see here is this is a position gradient. So it does exactly what it says, where it's actually using world space now. And it's actually affecting to where we get a top-down uh, effect to where, as you can see, now we've got this stone just on the top, and it's coming down, and it's got this nice kind of blend. That's all great and everything, but that's not exactly what we're going for here. So uh, I'm going to invert this, and I'm going to hit 9 so we can see our mask, and I'll just change my range. Change my range, and now... As you can see, I changed my range to where we get just that small amount just on the base, which is great. And then, boom, we've got that. So the only thing I'm going to do is actually just change the order of this so we still get uh, the moss on the top and we still get those crevice details. Um, but now we've got our edge highlight, we've got moss on this, and we've got a completely different material just in almost no time, which is really, really cool. So that's how easy it is to sort of go in and retexture something. Um, one of the things that's really cool about this here too, just to take it a step further, I can add all this to a smart material. So I'll just save this as a group and we'll call this uh, moss buildup. Cool. And we'll export this as a smart material. Call it moss buildup and we'll export it. And this is adding it to my library. So all the work that we just did, we can now bring that onto another asset. Like let's say my director comes back and says, this is amazing. Love it. I want this on the next 20 assets that we just made. Cool. That's really easy. So why don't we load in another Japanese statue here and I'll load in, uh, let's load in this pillar. And now we have exactly that same stuff and it just loaded in seconds. Like that's how easy it was. So we have the exact same thing we were just looking at and I can apply this to anything, right? I've got my moss build up here. I've got my edge highlight. I've got everything. And we've got even that nice variation of like a different rock here at the bottom. And then the buildup from the top vector here as well. So that's how easy it is to really kind of go in there and do that. Um, I really love the ability to just kind of switch between this stuff. Um, you know, I can do the same. I can load in this, this railing here. We get the exact same effect on this. You know, obviously we would, you know, for something like this, we'd probably change it a little bit to where maybe we didn't get that moss buildup on the top. That'd be really easy to fix. Um, but it's really easy to just kind of go in there and start subbing out assets, you know, put it on a fire hydrant if you want to, whatever you want to do, right? Um, it just makes it really, really easy to kind of do that. So let's take it a step further because obviously, you know, this looks great and everything. It looks kind of close to what it is that we had before with some additional notes. But let's say we want to just nuke this all together. And my director says, you know what? I want this to be metal. Okay, that's easy. So why don't we go in and we have some smart materials here that ship with the application. All these are baked into the application and you have to download them on the front side of things. When you're installing Mixer, it will tell you, do you want to install these smart materials? Just say yes, you want to install them. And these smart materials are really, really nice. So let's say my director says, all right, I want this to be more of like a brass. Cool, let's make it brass. So we'll bring it in, the smart material, and boom, we have, a, we have a brass statue now in seconds. So let's go in here and start to make some changes to this guy. Um, you know, let's say I want maybe the oxida oxidization to be a little bit different here. So I can go and affect the curvature of this, maybe kind of bring it more in line with what it is that I'm going for. And then just like that, you know, we have a completely new statue in almost no time. That's how easy it is to sort of go in and start to retexture something. Any questions on any of that? I know I kind of moved through it pretty quick. Well, we've got a, a few questions that come up. We might get some more rolling in in just a minute or two specifically on what you just showed us. Sure. Um, but uh, let's see here. <laughs> okay, this is an interesting question. Um, 
uh, is your 3D scanning process taught anywhere or is it all a secret? That is the secret sauce. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we, uh, we don't talk about it. <laughs> Well, that's what you guys have been working so hard to do, right? I mean, and you, there's there's photogrammetry, and then there's there's you know, whatever it is you guys are doing to create these amazing assets. Yeah. Um, like I said, there's tons of articles about how you can scan with your iPhone. I can tell you right now that we don't do that, but I mean, <laughs> it's totally up to you. Are you sure? Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, another question from uh, Joe uh, Jacobs, I believe. Uh, is there a way to audition a 3D asset inside of Mixer while you're creating a texture? Maybe I'm not familiar with the vernacular. When you say audition, what do you? Yeah, mean? that's I. I can. I, I'm wondering if they were certainly referring to like something that they maybe a custom actor or asset that they've created that they want to bring in that geo, um, and kind of you know if you've got your materials set up maybe. I'm I'm guessing here, but maybe bring that in. And say what would what would it look like with this material on it? Yeah, I mean, uh, the only thing that you need in order to sort of effectively mix here, when you bring in your own custom asset, is you need to have a normal map associated with it. You need to have ambient occlusion. You need to have cavity or curvature, um, and displacement if you have it. But I mean. You just need to have all the inputs so that you can start to do this stuff, right? If it doesn't have those inputs, you can mix. Like, so with curvature as an example here, I can mix with just the mesh itself. Like, so it will basically create curvature based on the mesh, but it's not going to be as detailed as like something that you go in and sculpt right in ZBrush or that you've, you've, you've done a really effective bake, you know, in Max or Maya or something like that. Um, so yeah, I don't know. As long as you have all those inputs, then yes, you can bring in your own custom assets all day. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see here. Can you texture a custom? A this may be, um, this may be addressing what you just told us here. Let's see. Uh, can you texture a custom asset without UVs? Um, the asset would be made up of multiple components. Uh, not right now. No, because, uh, yeah, we uh, basically everything is still based on UVs here. So like, so this as an example, right? So this is what this is laid out like as an unwrapped element here. Um, so the textures themselves, um, they're not, they're not using hexaplanar projection that's separate from UV space. They still have to basically live inside of zero to one in order to actually uh, do all the things that we're doing. So. Okay. Um, and let's see, uh, RenderMan Pro question. Uh, if I have hundreds of assets, can I process them in a batch in Mixer? In other words, like import, generate masks, material, and export uh, with Python or et cetera? That is a really good question. Uh, the answer to that is not right now. Um, Mixer is technically still in beta. Uh, so, and so one of the things that's really important to note here as well is that we're actually doing a full rewrite of this application right now to actually make it so that it's embedded inside of Unreal Engine 5. So this is actually gonna be way more integrated into the engine than it ever was before. Um, and so with that, uh, that's just one of those features that sort of kind of didn't make it uh, before the rewrite, um, but it is something that we're doing. Batch exports and batch processing is something that's super important uh, for a lot of big projects. And so believe me, it's very, very high on the list, but it didn't make it into, uh, this current iteration. It's going to go into the rewrite for sure. All right. And then, uh, this is an interesting question, uh, from Jonathan Mueller. Is this workflow mainly for static objects or environment, et cetera, or is there a way that characters could make use of this as well? Um, and he's got in parentheses, uh, when you did the vertical gradient would that change as a character moves? I mean, it wouldn't change as a character moves because it's, I mean, that material information is baked onto the, the character itself. Now you could, inside of the engine or whatever application you're using, I mean, you can change those parameters so that it actually does uh, start to switch, you know, between various materials. So like, as an example, if like a character was to be walking, you know, through some water or some snow or something like that. You can make it so that there's different materials associated with like the genes of that character or something to where 
when they walk through that specific material that the material changes so that it makes a different version of that. Um, but that's something you would control inside the engine. So Mixer only makes it so that you create the inputs and then you have to do the work to hook it up in whatever it is that you're working inside. Uh, does that make sense? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm following, uh, and I'm, I'm probably a little bit more of a noob to this than a lot of people watching. So <laughs> I, I presume that it makes sense. Um, uh, one other question. Um, do you have plans in, let me make sure I'm getting the question right here. Do you have plans in internal ambient occlusion, uh, slash normal bat, normal map Baker in mixer? Uh, does that, is any of that scanning for you? I'm not sure that I fully yeah. really understand the question. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, okay. Yeah, so that's another heavily requested feature that didn't make it into this current iteration. It is happening in the rewrite, though. Um, this is something that people have been very vocal about that they want and need in their projects um, is to be able to you know, take in high poly and low poly information um, for whatever it is that they're making and uh, be able to bake it, you know, directly in the application, so they don't have to have 3D Studio Max and Next Normal or Marmoset, and then bring it into Mixer and everything. So, yeah, this is definitely something that we're working on to try to keep the experience in one application, if at all possible. Cool. Um, and then, lastly, uh, let's see, Cowboy Roy, you got to love these names in the chat, by the way. Um, is there a major difference between uh, smart materials what you showed us to get the the brass at the end and what you were doing before that? Um, well, I wouldn't say that there's a difference, right? I mean, it's just uh, it's just a workflow. It's just up to you with how you want to sort of go about it, right? Um, yeah, I mean, to create a smart material, right? That's just something that you sort of have to premeditate in a way, right? Consider the different assets that are going to be using the same type of smart material. Um, and then from there, you know, start to figure out exactly like how much is this going to deviate like from mesh to mesh once I actually sort of create those inputs and hooks. Um, but no, I mean, I would just say, you know, for, for something that's more unique, right? Um, you just have to consider like if you're texturing something that's completely one off, right? Completely one off, right? Like it's, it goes without saying that you wouldn't take the same smart material for a fire hydrant as you would, you know, for, you know, this, this, uh, statue that we just made. Right. Um, so those are just the types of considerations that you would have to make on the front end. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're just texturing something at the end of the day. So I guess in that regard, they're kind of the same, but, just more of a workflow thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. A um, couple more questions still trickling in uh, just while we're talking here. And um, this may be something you're planning on addressing later. Uh, it's a, a little more of a probably licensing oriented question, but someone's just wanting to know, uh, are you able to use these assets on, um, uh, sorry, on like, you know, professional projects uh, for profit projects, that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you just have to be aware of the EULAs associated with usage. So um, make sure that you know, you know, before you're agreeing to the EULAs, obviously, that um, there are speculation, or there there are stipulations, sorry, um, you know, that you have to sort of adhere to based on, you know, the project and everything that you're doing with it. So, um, you know, for our bigger, you know, AAA clients, right? They they engage in a different type of contract than small indie teams, right? Um, so you can read all about licensing um, on our site, you know, and in the EULAs and everything like that. I would just say, yeah, like you can absolutely use it um, at, for for something that would be made for profit. Obviously, just make sure you know because you're licensing not only the content, right? You're also licensing the engine at that point. Um, assuming you're using Epic ID. Uh, so that's just something to note. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, and then, yeah, I think we're all caught up at this point. We're doing good. Cool. Questions wise. I mean, uh, I don't really have much else to show unless there's something specific that people want to see. So, I mean, it's up to the group. Like if there's, um, if there's something that people would like to see specifically, I'm happy to go and demo that, but, uh, we have, this maybe if you, 
learn. So yeah, if you have uh, maybe if you could give us a couple of options, like hey, I could do a demo on this, or I could do a demo on that. We could take a quick uh, a quick vote or a quick poll from the chat, and then uh, I mean whatever you're going to show us is going to be cool. So I don't think anybody's going to be disappointed. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we have, you know, 3D assets, you know, we could texture another 3D asset if we just want to kind of see like that same workflow again um, of going through and just sort of um, maybe taking, you know, fire hydrant, you know, and actually making it a red fire hydrant like a normal fire hydrant should be, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> uh, but yeah, we could take a look at a lot of different things. Um, you know, I always like to retexture a lot of like these types of like cliffs, you know, this type of thing. These are a lot of fun to take a crack at. That actually be really cool. Um, yeah, yeah to, to something on a, on a larger scale uh, sure. that would be making up a larger portion of an environment. Um, yeah. yeah, why don't we just jump into that, and then uh, if people have uh, questions or any you know any particular thing they'd be interested in seeing, they can chime in as we go. Cool. Let's do it. All right. Well, I'm just going to retexture a cliff here, so I'm just going to do away with that, um, and then we'll just go in and start to look at a new 3D asset here. So. Uh, this is where you can kind of go in, by the way, I don't know if I covered any of this, like on the front end of it, but you can bring in a custom mesh here. This is where you would go about that process. Um, or you can just bring in a 3D asset, which would be what we're going to do right now, uh, just in sort of taking something directly from the library and start mixing that directly. Um, so I can bring this guy in here uh, just as an example. So this is a really cool cliff here. So why don't we sort of do that same exact process of kind of generally taking this and sort of um, now retexturing it with some of the same type of rules that we were just looking at. So um, again, this is kind of the nice thing about working inside of this application is that we can go up and down resolution here. Um, and we can also go and start to change uh, some of the features just in sort of uh, the UI itself as far as previewing. So as an example of that, I can select up and down on the keyboard and that will actually just change the HDRI that's, that's actually in this scene here, which is kind of nice. Uh, we will be adding in uh, for the rewrite, the ability to bring your own HDRIs, that's a heavily requested feature. Um, but for right now, uh, this is this is the way it works. We've got a couple in here that are pretty nice. So um, a couple other things that maybe I didn't cover is that you can obviously have a grid here if you want. You can change, you know, the, the I know this is a huge asset, so um, you can change some of the grid features here as well. Um, we also have some performance features here on this side. So you could change the resolution just to sort of make it easier to start to mix inside of uh, your inside of your project. Um, you can down sample textures if you want. And then obviously there's like some more camera movement optimization stuff here on the side with shadows and tessellation and what have you. So there's a lot of stuff here. If you find that the application is chugging for you specifically like on your box, just know that there are ways to go in here and start to make it so that it's a little bit uh, easier on the GPU. So uh, that's one thing to note here. Um, and then obviously, you know, we have some display features here so I can make it flat or I can actually have a skybox in here if I would like. So that's just another uh, way of sort of previewing. I generally kind of like the gradient, I guess, it's just kind of my Max Maya background. It just sort of makes me feel at home here. So um, you can have that. Um, and then obviously light intensity, uh, you can change stuff like that. And then the way I'm actually moving the camera is actually shift and right click. So that's, that's the way I'm kind of moving the camera around here. Um, and then, like I said, you know, you can change even more features in here, you know, with the shadow resolution, these types of things. So um, why don't we go in and start to retexture this guy? So uh, what I'll do is load in now, we'll load in a rock and uh, let's see what I have in here. I'd like this kind of jagged rock and then this rock surface here. I think both of these are great. So we'll just load this guy in here. And obviously we need to manipulate scale. It's kind of the first thing that we need to do. Um, so what we've got here is now we've loaded this asset onto this, this, uh, this loaded this uh, material rather directly onto the surface. And then now we can actually go in and start to change the projection of it here as well. So we have this, this really nice slider here, this uh, radial slider that allows us to sort of orient the texture in such a way to where we actually get exactly what it is that we're trying to get. So, and again, uh, you know, we've got hexaplanar projection here. So this is doing it in such a way to where you're going to see a lot of tiling here on the surface. But one thing that's really nice is that you can actually change it. So I could set it to tiling if I wanted to. And this will actually adhere to the UV seams. So this will actually give you 
depending on like the rotation of the actual UV shells themselves, this could give you a completely different look. Now, this is entirely up to how you unwrap the asset. So that's just one thing to note is that if you have something that just truly is not cooperating with this specific workflow uh, in being able to go in and use that tiling feature instead of hexaplanar projection, just maybe manipulate your UVs a little bit and that might kind of give you uh, a different result. So why don't we sort of use this as our base? I kind of really like where this is actually headed already. So um, change the albedo here slightly. You make it a little bit darker, uh, more in the range of what it is that I'm trying to get here. And then once again, uh, what I'd like to do is kind of similar to the last mix, just in sort of following that same type of workflow, is I want to do a couple things where I maybe break up uh, the edges of this, uh, maybe bump them up a little bit slightly, and so where we get something that's a little bit different. So I'll drag in this rock surface now. And this rock surface, obviously, uh, we need to change this guy here to where we get the scale a little bit more in line with what it is that we need here. And what's cool here too is like we were looking at before with the surface mix, is that I can actually blur everything underneath it if I wanted to, um, which is really kind of a nice feature. So you can you can play with this to where maybe you wipe out some of that normal information, um, but I'm gonna kind of keep both of these here because I think that they're, they're both kind of nice. Um, but what I'm gonna do is uh, go and average the, the information here for the albedo so we actually get it to where this is actually really close to what we had below it. Um, but then I'm just gonna raise that value slightly here to where we get just a slight edge highlight now. So what I'll do is actually go into my mask stack and then we can add in our curvature component here. Hit nine on the keyboard so we can actually see exactly what we're getting here. And then now we're getting a really, really nice effect here on the surface where we're bumping the edges of this slightly. So if I, I'm just, I'm just isolating albedo here so you can see it, but just turning that on and off you can see that now we've actually got a really, really nice edge highlight here. So this is all great and everything, but I think the one thing that really sticks out to me is that this obviously just looks very generated. It looks like I'm using curvature in order to uh, kind of get something that uh, that otherwise, you know, would, we're trying to get more of a natural look for this, right? So this is, looks very generated. So why don't we stack a couple components on top of this? So. What I'll do is first of all, I'll load in a map component. Now the map component is really cool because I can actually load in either my own image, like a custom image, or I can bring something from the library here. And what's nice about this is that we have this imperfection section of the library where I can actually go in and I can bring in these, these types of really, really nice assets to start to break up what it is that I'm seeing. So I can actually use these as a mask if I want to. So I'll bring in just like this old varnish because uh, I think that this old varnish is actually like a really, really nice uh, breakup asset here. So let's load this guy in. And if I hit nine on the keyboard, you can see what this looks like here. So I can change the range of this uh, to where we get something that's more in line with what I'm doing. But as you can see, just loading this in in zero to one space, it's not great, right? Like this isn't, this isn't really what it is that I was trying to get. Um, so I want to change this now to where we're actually using this in a different way. So I can add in a projection uh, node on top of this, and I can actually append this by alt clicking directly onto that map, and I can now change this to hexaplanar projection. So now we're getting that imperfection tiled on the surface directly onto this guy, and we can actually change some of these other features here, like the radius to kind of get, uh, and the height influence to kind of get this to, to break up a little bit more, but as you can see, We've got something just completely different now. Um, we've got originally, I'll just I'll just turn this off so you can see what the effect is, obviously. So this is loaded in in zero to one, not great. We can add in a projection, and then now we're able to have all this other stuff that we can play with, the radio slider, we can affect the scale of this guy, we can do all types of things. But we're using this now to just go and start to break up what's below it. So if I set this to multiply, as you can see, now this is actually having an effect on that material that we're looking at down below. So we can affect you know, the opacity of this here as well. So where we get maybe more or less of it, maybe I wanna try some of these other guys out, maybe like subtraction or something and see what that looks like. Um, but as you can see, this is just breaking this up in such a different way than what we had before. And we're able to get something just completely different. Um, so I would just encourage you guys to maybe go in, mess around with some of these different uh, 
blending modes because I think you'll be surprised at sort of what you get. Um, but again, all this stuff is non-destructive, right? So we can go in now and start to really affect maybe the range of this, uh, you know, and try to get something that's a little bit more in line with what it is that we're doing uh, and just try to find something that works for our purposes. So, so now we've got this really nice edge highlight on the surface. And I want to bump this up a little bit, maybe change the albedo so that it's even lighter here because I think we're losing it a little bit. And then now, what's nice about this here too is that I can go in on a per channel basis, right, which is really, really neat. I can say for the albedo, right, I can say for albedo here, I want to change the, the blending mode to where maybe I'm overlaying this on top so that we get maybe the best of both of these. So let's try that. I can just overlay this on top. And so now we've got the edge highlight sort of playing with what is base, the base texture here. Um, or we can have it just be a normal to where it's actually stomping it all together. Uh, you know, and that's something you can do as well. But what's really nice is that you can do this on a per channel asset or per channel basis here, right? So I can change the roughness of this, maybe make the roughness actually adhere closer to what it is that's below it if I wanted to. Um, or have it be something just completely different. So uh, lots of different things you can do to play with that in each of these different inputs. I would encourage you to look at all of them uh, because there's just a lot in here to sort of unpack, so. Very cool. So then let's see here, why don't we add in sort of our moss that we were doing before here too, because we want the moss to kind of sit in some of the crevices for this as well. So we'll change the scale of this, make it so that it's relatively in line with some of the other textural details that we have here. And we'll add in our mask component, curvature, and we'll make it so that it is cavities only, and then nine on the keyboard so you can see what that looks like. And we'll make some anti-aliasing here. And then we can change this to where our levels actually get us the desired result. So we'll change this, and as you can see, now we've got some nice moss building up in the cracks and the crevices here. We've got something that just looks really, really great. So again, we can do the exact same thing here um, with a map component, or we have another thing you could do, which is actual noise. So you could bring in Perlin noise as an example here. If I hit nine, you can see what this looks like. So if I change my frequency of this, you can see exactly what it is that we're working with. And I can see the value here to get something different. So this is actually procedural, right? It's not based on scan data. This is actually something that's entirely procedural. So once again, we run into this problem though, as you can see here, where we actually see exactly where the seams are for this, right? Which is just not great. That's not what we're going for. We don't want these weird, awkward seams to be on the surface because that's not helping anyone here. So why don't we do a projection modifier on top, append it by alt clicking here, and then we'll change this to box projection now to where we're actually getting this, now to where we get this procedural noise on the surface and it fully tiles which is really, really cool to be able to go in and start to make these types of changes. So now we've got this and we can start to change the scale here. And again, I can affect this all the way non-destructively here as well, affect the frequency of it. So now we're getting this and we've actually got some really nice procedural noise on the surface. We have these nice kind of blending features here as well that will go in and start to mask out those seams here as well. But again, the idea here is that we wanna use this as a multiply feature. So now we're actually multiplying this on top and we've broken up the surface now, not based with scan data, but actually using an entirely procedural approach, which is kind of a neat uh, component here. So again, you can start to go in here and uh, you know affect maybe the amplitude of this, maybe change some of the blending modes here to kind of get something that's more favorable for you. That's entirely something you could do. Um, another thing actually, and I'll show this on the edge highlight because I think it's maybe a better example here is that we have this really kind of cool feature where we can actually go in and add in uh, noise, but we can change our blend mode to distort. Now what this will do, if I turn this on and off, what you'll see here is that this is actually literally distorting the surface. And if I change my distort intensity, you'll see that it's really peeling away, like really kind of going crazy here. And we can change this, change the amplitude of it, maybe change the frequency of it. But as you can see, this gets you some really crazy effects. So this is where you start to be able to kind of take procedural components, mix them with scan data, and actually do something entirely different. So let's say that, you know, just as an example with the edge highlight, that again, it just feels way too uh, generated here. I can change it so that my distort intensity, so if I change this, you know, just to 
zero as my base, and then I start to warp it slightly. As you can see here, now it's not adhering to exactly what it is that the mesh actually designates based on its curvature material properties. So that's another way you can go in and start to manipulate this just to break it up even more. So um, that's a really nice way of doing it here as well. So why don't we do one more thing here by bringing in another rock material, just kind of doing what we were doing before of breaking this up a little bit and having it to where it's not just that same material across the entire surface. So I'll type in rock once again, and just sort of see what we have here. Uh, let's grab, just for fun, why don't we grab, let's see. This is just what I have locally. Uh, let's bring in this guy, this black rock. All right, we'll bring it to the top so we can really kind of see exactly what it is that we're working with here. Change the scale of this. So now we can see exactly what this is doing. I think it's a decent material. It's kind of boring here, but it's enough to sort of break up what it is that we have going below. So what we can do is I'll just drag this now to where this is actually gonna, we're still gonna, we still want all the work that we just did. Um, but actually I'll, I'll bring it to the top for now. Sorry, I'm changing my mind here on the fly. So um, we can move it here to where we get it at the top so we can actually kind of see exactly what it is that we're doing. But I wanna use a mask component on this guy here as well. And this time I'm gonna bring in a map component and we'll bring in, let's say, let's find something else in here that looks really good from an imperfection standpoint. Let's bring in something, I think this zinc, uh, let's see. Maybe this leakage, this might be kind of interesting. We'll see how this goes. Doing it on the fly here. So, uh, so we'll bring the leakage real quick. <clears throat> we'll see what this looks like. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is looking kind of interesting actually. I think we can work with this, um, but we want to do a couple things, right? We, first of all, we want to make it tiling. So we want to add in a projection node on top and then append it, and then we'll make it so that it is box projection and we'll change the scale. And then we'll sort of manipulate some of these, these values and so we get something that's more in line with what it is that we're trying to get. Or, you know, why don't we just, just to see it, you know, honestly, this tiling doesn't look half bad and we're gonna have it actually mask a couple things. So I'm gonna keep it like this because I wanna actually see how this goes. So um, what we're gonna do now is that we can actually see what this looks like just by masking it on top. But what we're looking at right now is obviously not great because it's sort of like a middle gray, so we're not actually getting a true blend between the two. So what we'll do is add in a brightness contrast node, so we'll add in some contrast here to where now we're actually getting something to where we're manipulating the entire mask. And so now we're getting that, the streaks of that material from down below. So now we've got something to where, and I'll, what I'll do here just to make it a little bit more visible is maybe change the uh, the albedo here to where it's really, really drastic. We'll be able to notice it for sure. Um, so we'll change it to where it's a little bit darker, maybe a little bit more saturated in here to give us a, like a little bit more of like a pop of some color here. But now we've got this just breaking up the surface even more. And this is kind of a nice little effect here. Uh, we could change it to where we maybe get some more repetitions on this. Let's see if that looks any better here. Yeah, we're just adding in some splashes of color, which I think looks kind of neat. Um, and again, we can start to offset this in any direction here, and then we can move it in X and Y like we were talking about. The other thing that we can do is let's say that we find an area that's just egregious, that we don't really, really like, that we want a more custom solution uh, for masking here. So let's say like with, with this moss here, let's say that I really just don't like moss in this corner for whatever reason. I don't know why. We just don't like it there. We can actually go and we can add in a paint mask. And this will allow us to go in and we can use uh, we can use a mask in order to actually go in and paint out exactly what it is that we don't like. So we can use a combination of these two elements of something that's entirely procedural and something that's a little bit more custom, obviously, by painting. Now, conversely, we can actually switch it to where we actually get full white and we can bring in our own brushes. So let's say I like this sort of decal that I've brought in here and we can actually paint now that moss may be seeping down from the corners. We can do that here as well. And just reintroduce exactly where it is on the surface that we actually want that effect. 
paint that directly on the mesh itself, which is pretty fun. And we have a bunch of brushes where you can do this. So if you just go to online, the online tab here and you look at brushes, this is all the different brushes. These are all the different brushes that we have. So there's a lot of stuff here, a lot of different functionality you could sort of bring into your mix of painting on these custom features to kind of give you a little bit more of a, a special result for what it is that you're doing. So. So yeah, I mean, there it is. We just sort of retextured a cliff. I'll just sort of show it at the base so we can actually see what we started with. It positioned nicely. And that's what we started with. This is what we have now. So just completely different and not a lot of time to make it happen. So it's kind of neat. I love how intuitive it is too. The, the process you just showed us. Um, you can kind of jump in out of in and out of sort of this procedural, and then you can kind of just go, well, I want to custom paint some things as well. Um, and you're getting such fast results yep. um, in the process. It's amazing. Um, in Made just a little artists, bit for artists, you know, <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. Um, in a little bit of time that we have left, uh, we did have one question come up. Uh, originally, we were talking about what well, we could have you demo. Um, and of course, I don't know that you have time for this right now. It's, a, it's, you know, can you do like an interior, some sort of a room or something like that? But maybe uh, we could utilize what time we do have to kind of address, you know, those types of assets for people that might be doing interior environments um, oh, in that absolutely. sense. Um, so what I will show actually is we do a lot of different training materials specifically regarding um, specifically regarding you know creating assets and creating materials inside of Unreal Engine. So I'll show a couple of things here real quick in case you guys haven't seen these already. So let me find it here real quick. So we did sort of a small like interior uh, with this this example here. Um, so this is like kind of an abandoned, uh, abandoned apartment, actually, um, sort of post-apocalyptic kind of Last of Us 2 vibes. Um, and so uh, we actually did full training content, like a three-part tutorial series on making something exactly like this. Uh, so for the sake of time and to actually point you towards objectively way better material, I would just actually uh, redirect you over towards this because uh, I think this would just give you a way better understanding of how to do it. So kind of like these abandoned hallways and stuff like that. Um, it's kind of fun to be able to sort of go through and make something like this. So that's a really great example of an interior. Uh, kind of game arty, obviously, you know, uh, but it's definitely something that you can do. Um, it's kind of in the interior category, I would say. That's gorgeous. Yeah. So really nice. go to, you know, our, uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, just type in Quixel, you know, and you'll be able to get You'll be able to get that whole training uh, just right here. So it'll show you every single thing here. So we've got this three-part series. So, I mean, it's almost uh, 20 minutes worth of content here. Uh, it's really, really great. So it, block, it goes through everything. So lighting, set dressing, the basic design, and obviously using the Megascans ecosystem to sort of make it all happen. Uh, and then we did this one here as well. This is another really great one uh, sort of show um, an interior. Or this isn't an interior, but... Um, same type of idea, you know, being able to sort of create these types of environments very quickly, sort of using mega scans and Unreal Engine. Um, but it shows the whole process and really kind of breaks down a lot of the tech here as well. Um, so I, I, I would check out these because that would be kind of the best, the best way to kind of get that example kind of done quickly. Awesome. Um, so one of our viewers was wanting to know if yet there are any, um, you know, assets or materials uh, dealing with gems or crystals or minerals? That's a great question, actually. So we uh, we actually did, or I think I did, actually. <laughs> I made a tutorial uh, a long time ago, in fact, uh, where we actually make an example of this. And this is all procedural, actually. So using procedural components to sort of create uh, a jewel mix. So... Um, so yeah, you can definitely do this. Uh, this is something I made in Mixer entirely. Um, so you can definitely do this it's kind of like an obsidian mix. That's uh, cool. And then let's see, I also did another one actually. It's really similar to this. Um, shameless plug, I'll pull up my art station. And then uh, so you can see exactly what it is that I did. So this is another, I call it a jade-ish. <laughs> so there's a mix of like 
procedural components sort of mixed with uh, some scan data in here as well. So this is something that you could definitely do 100% um, in Mixer. So it's a lot of fun. And I was really fascinated earlier, you, you touched on just a little bit of, you know, how people are using this for more stylized um, looking games and environments. Um, could you unpack that just a little bit more for us? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'll pull up one of my colleagues art stations now because he has some amazing examples of this. So uh, just as an example, right, like he recreated uh, Ogremar uh, in Unreal 4 using Megascan's assets, you know, very painterly sort of approach to Ogremar, obviously, uh, and next gen sort of in nature, obviously. Um, but yeah, he did a really, really awesome job of sort of taking something that was otherwise very photoreal and making it very painterly, um, you know, kind of impressionistic almost, which is really, really cool. Uh, and then obviously taking that even further with, you know, some of the stuff like this, you know, entirely procedural uh, using Mixer and then uh, being able to have like some parametric control like this, right, of changing, you know, the way that the rocks actually integrate with the sand and uh, that type of thing, but very stylized, you know, in its approach and execution. So um, he did that one, which is really cool. Um, this is kind of neat, just like a texture only kind of fantasy house. This is actually just the texture uh and yeah, he did this entirely in Mixer. Kind of shows just how you can kind of take these scan assets and kind of manipulate them to create something that's stylized. Um, I'm trying to think, yeah, we also did this one. It's like a stylized wood planks, kind of like the style of um, uh, Dishonored. I think was kind of the main inspiration for something like this. So mm -hmm. great breakdown of this here on uh, on our YouTube channel here as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, give Victor a follow too. I mean, his stuff is amazing. So yeah, very uh, cool. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it. You know, solid layers are definitely like the way in which you would sort of go about a lot of this, right? Um, and then, you know, you sort of use scan data to sort of break it up and inject, you know, different pieces from that whole workflow sort of into uh, what it is that, uh, that you're trying to accomplish. But yeah, and then that tutorial that I showed, you know, earlier on is also a really great example of just kind of uh, either taking Megascan's assets or bringing in your own content that you might have sculpted inside of ZBrush and uh, having something, you know, that that's environment focused, right? Just using Mixer and Unreal entirely. So very cool. No, this, this is, it's a brave new world. I think um, <laughs> with everything so. that's going on. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, really awesome. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to check to see here if, uh, we have any other questions we haven't addressed. We got a few minutes left guys. So if there's any questions that you've got on the tip of your tongue, um, anything burning in your brain that you want to ask uh, Galen, uh, please feel free to put that in the chat and uh, Miranda will get that to us. Um, oh, okay, cool. All right. I'm getting a note from a producer actually that we are about at the point to wrap anyway. So perfect timing. Um, but uh, yeah, Galen, thank you so much. This has been a delight. Uh, to be able to, I mean, I've, I've been looking at uh, Meg, mega scans and, and mixer uh, for, for a while now, but it's so great to get it from the source um, and to see you, you know, really show us what it's capable of. So this has been a real treat. Thanks for giving your time tonight. Yeah. Awesome. Glad you guys stuck yeah. around for this long. This is fun. Oh yeah, for sure. This is super cool. And again, um, it's entirely free. So y'all have no excuses. Go download it. It's free. <laughs> now, is there anything, is there the, any, um, uh, like, uh, additional beyond the free required if you want to be able to port any of these assets to to other renderers or to you know to, to blender or Maya or that sort of a thing so we um so for Nomen specifically we actually have a separate educational license if you want to do something that's outside of unreal engine so mm -hmm. we do have an entire offering that's like unique to uh everything other than unreal um so we could set something up like that up, you know, for the campus, if that was something you guys want to do. Um, we just figure, you know, you guys are big Unreal Engine users, obviously. So yeah, sure definitely. We're kind of using it in that regard. Um, but yeah, I mean, we could set something up, you know, like a custom license for that. Um, but again, you know, if you're using it on a custom project outside of Unreal, uh, just make sure you read the EULAs on the website. And even for someone using Unreal, just read the EULAs in case, um, just to be sure. Awesome. Um, very cool. Uh, definitely a tool <laughs> worth looking into because I don't think there's anything else out there like it in that sense. So uh, really cool stuff, Galen. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Um, 
Yeah, so uh, just wanted to uh, highlight for our viewers really quick uh, some of the additional content we have um, coming up. Just need to pull that up really quick. I've been um, I've been watching the stream uh, muted on Twitch just to get a larger resolution uh, image of everything you've been showing us because I've been so fascinated by it. Um, but let me just jump um, back in. There we go. Pull up my info on the upcoming events. Or actually, Miranda, if you just want to uh, put into the chat um, what we need to get out there um, right away, um, I can also pull that up on the Noman website. There we go. Okay, so just some of the events for you guys coming up. Um, Actually, uh, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, I will be uh, joined by our one of our admissions advisors, Zach Mendoza, where we are going to be talking about building your portfolio at Nomen. Um, that is going to be having to do with getting started in our foundation in art and design course. Um, so this is a course designed to help you build the kind of portfolio um, that you're going to want to use to apply to our full-time programs at Nomen um, and to help you maybe pick up some, some of the foundational skills that you haven't had the opportunity uh, to pick up yet. And then uh, after that, coming up uh, a week from tomorrow on Friday, August 28th, we, uh, which is kind of applicable to what we're talking about tonight, is we're going to be talking about getting started in games with our education uh, lead, Anton uh, Napirala. And he's going to be talking about what we are teaching at Nomen currently um, within Unreal Engine, um, how we are preparing people to go work uh, in studio, in games, um, in the various digital production disciplines that we teach here at Nomen. So again, that's going to be next Friday, August 28th um, at 11 a.m. So there's just a few of our events coming up. Uh, and don't forget that every Wednesday morning, starting at 10 o'clock, until one o'clock in the afternoon, you can uh, come to our Twitch channel right here and join our chief creative officer, Josh Herman, who every Wednesday has an art jam where he uh, was working on projects and you get to hang with him, ask him questions about his, pro his process, um, learn about whatever a particular software or discipline he's working within. Lately, he's been making some really, really cool stuff in ZBrush um, and uh, has been sharing a lot of his knowledge just in a more of informal uh, hanging out with another artist kind of a setting. So again, that's every Wednesday, guys, at 10 a.m. So once again, my name is Adam. It's been my pleasure to host you here this evening. Thank you again to Galen for being with us. Um, this has been an awesome event. Um, this also will be available on uh, you know our library of, of, of events that we've done here on our Twitch channel. If, if you haven't had the opportunity to see, to see the entire thing, or you know someone that wants to see this, you can go back and view it. It'll be cataloged on our YouTube channel as well as a resource that's gonna be available to people. So guys, thanks for tuning in again. Uh, just say be safe and continue to be creative. And we hope to see you back here at the stream